This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com, and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. As part of our ongoing series on financial repression, I have Marshall Auerbach joining us this morning from New York. Marshall is Director of Institutional Partnerships at the George Soros-founded Institute for New Economic Thinking, or what is referred to as INET. Marshall, maybe we can begin with you describing how you came about joining INET. So in 2008, I, I decided that what we were seeing was unprecedented, historic, and uh, I still wanted to observe it, but I didn't feel like being an active practitioner. Um, I had done some work beforehand for another think tank called the Roosevelt Institute. The director there, one of the directors there, um, Rob Johnson, who used to work with George Soros as a fund manager, called me up and asked me if I'd be interested in in joining the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, the idea behind the Institute is that um, it's really to answer the question posed by the Queen. You know, why did so many people miss this? And and, and I think we felt that um, part of the, the real problem is that um, the mainstream economics profession is in love with these neoclassical models that have no bearing on, on actual reality. Uh, they treat finance as a footnote. We thought there was, it was important to establish a new institute which could revive the teaching of economics and hopefully um, have a more sensible policy discourse which um, reflected in economics as it is uh, seen and in, the, in the real world, as opposed to um, one which... Um, uh, it's a stylized version that you see in the economics textbook. So that's how it all started, and we've been going now for about five years. Well, I encourage our listeners to go to your site or to the site. Uh, you're doing great work and to uh, to, to uh, support Thank you. Uh, INET. Uh, you've done some great interviews, too, by the way, so I compliment, I compliment Thank you. you on them. Uh, we're here to talk about financial repression. I, I wonder if we could uh, begin with you defining what you see it to be in your words. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do so. I mean, I think financial repression is, it can be a fairly loaded word. I, I mean, I think you could say that anytime you have a central bank, which is a monopoly issue of, of anything, whether it be a, a currency or uh, interest rates, uh, there's a degree of financial repression in the sense that any monopolist can accept, establish a price. So uh, I'm, I'm less concerned with the labels and more concerned with the fact that we have been, in response to this unprecedented crisis, we've been undertaking increasingly exotic uh, experiments on the part of the uh, the central banks, uh, notably quantitative easing, uh, which have had the effect of um, uh, repressing uh, interest rates or keeping them low, which of course is great for borrowers, but does have the unintended uh, byproduct of hurting savers, depriving people of income. Um, and I think it's, a, it's also uh, an experiment which is flawed uh, in terms of the economics behind it, uh, I don't think it does much to elevate aggregate demand, what we, a fancy word that we economists use for spending power. Um, and I think it, it, it turns out to be a large implicit subsidy for the financial sector. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, we're already overly financialized as an economy. We, we do too much for the banks anyway. And um, it's, it's really the, the, a fundamentally mistaken policy approach. What, what trends are you seeing in that regard on a global basis? Well, I mean, uh, the obvious ones, you know, we had, uh, what, three rounds of QE, quantitative easing by the Fed. Um, uh, we have the Bank of Japan uh, undertaking a similar uh, uh, venture in, in Tokyo. And um, more recently, now the European Central Bank has announced that it will start to undertake uh, quantitative easing uh, in, in, in their part of the world. And if you actually look at the, the impact, it's been uh, fairly minimal so far. I mean, the Japanese economy is still pretty stagnant. In the last quarter, it grew at 1.5%, but it contracted substantially before that. Uh, the U.S. is growing, uh, but I would say that it has less to do with quantitative easing and more to do with the fact that we had uh, a fairly robust uh, fiscal policy response after the crisis in 2009. Um, and um, likewise, in, in, in Europe, it's, it's been admired in, 
uh, depression-like numbers, which are worse than anything we had in the 1930s. So um, it hasn't really worked, and yet we, we keep trying it. Uh, the economics behind it are flawed. It's, it's based on this notion that if a bank buys a bond and puts reserves in the banking system, that somehow it can encourage the, uh, the, the banker to lend. That's wrong on two um, parts. One is uh, we don't actually lend out reserves. Uh, reserves are only used for interbank lending uh, amongst banks. But the more, second uh, and equally important construct is that uh, lending is a two-way process. Between You have to have a, a credit-worthy borrower on the other side, and you have to have a credit-worthy lender. And um, if you have uh, individuals or businesses that are piled down with debt, they may not be very credit-worthy, or they may be less inclined to take on more debt to support their, their sustain their, their, their businesses. So the idea is you want to be able to engender rising employment, rising incomes, uh, so that people aren't as reliant on credit. And I think that's a big uh, problem that our, our system has had over the last 30 years. It's become increasingly credit-centric rather than income-centric. Yeah, I would uh, argue, Marsha, quite strongly that we that actually capitalism is more or less dying on the vine, and I say that when you when you come uh, contrast to credit, that is, capitalism is about savings and applying that savings into productive assets that will yeah. produce real income. What we're doing now is we're actually trying to drive consumption through credit, and yes. the growth is coming out of consumption. The problem with that, it sometimes can be a short-term solution, is consumption doesn't create net cash flow, which pays the debt. So at some yeah. point that equilibrium is out of balance. Is that too yeah, simplistic? I think, no, no, I think that, I think that's fundamentally right. I mean, look, you know, we, we spent trillions of dollars, uh, bailing out the banks in 2008. Uh, we didn't do this in the, in the 1930s, by the way. We, uh, effectively, uh, nationalized a certain number of banks, shut them down, recapitalized them with, with, uh, government funding. But we replaced management, and um, at the meantime, we had some, uh, a significant form of debt restructuring. Here, we're not actually changing, fundamentally changing the, the system in, in the uh, in, in the form that got us into this mess in the first place. We're just handing out money to the, the banks willy-nilly. Uh, I'd rather see those trillions of dollars go into the hands of individual consumers who at least could spend the money and, 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 and drive economic activity. But more importantly, I, I just think that you know we, we we've been conducting. You know this this pulmonary resuscitation of what's fundamentally a dead financial system, rather than uh, using the money to try to uh, revive the economy and, and and transition it into more productive economic activities, as you suggest. I I noticed last quarter, ninety uh, percent of all profits of the S and P five hundred went but were returned to shareholders as either buybacks or dividends, which would leave a maximum of ten percent for investment. And you can see top line growth continuing to fall irrelevant yep. of earnings per share as there are less shares of standing. By definition, you can't have economic growth in that kind of sustained environment. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is something I commented on about uh, two years ago. We had uh, record profits as a percentage of GDP, but you were having no top-line growth. And and you, you, and you can only do so much financial engineering uh, and, and cost restructuring in order to platter your, your bottom line. But, but at a certain point, you've got to get people to buy your products. The problem is, when you have a, an economy which is overly financialized, in which you know banks account for a, a disproportionate amount of activity, and you have an incentive structure in place, a compensation incentive structure in place, which is highly dependent on share price appreciation, then you provide a, a very perverse incentive for businesses not to invest in productive parts of their businesses, but to use excess cash to buy back shares. Because, of course, they get paid on, on uh, how their, their stock uh, performs. They get a nice, generous amount of uh, options. This is the CEOs I'm talking about here and, and, and senior employees. So uh, they can cash out in a few years' time. Then, you know, if the business by that point is, is loaded up with a lot more debt, who cares? They've, they've, they've taken their... Ten or fifteen million dollar payday and, and move to the beach somewhere. So it's 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 a real problem. And worse than that is that you have an incentive to begin to um, use all sorts of accounting tricks to misstate earnings. This is what Professor Bill Black of uh, the University of Missouri Kansas City calls control fraud, and um, it's become a major feature of our system over the last few years. So you get um, a form of uh, casino capitalism. In fact, I think that's a very unfair term because I think the casinos in Las Vegas are actually regulated more fair, favorably than the banks are. And, Precisely. And, and, and actually, once in a while, uh, they have to pay the house. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't uh, work as... as, as it, I, so my apologies to the Las Vegas casino owners for making that comparison. I think Black's work is right, right on and it yeah. really gets to the core of the problem of the 2008, 2007, 2008 crisis of what had led up to it through the whole mortgage debacle. Yeah. 
of what the large institutions were really they, doing. They were, where, they were where, engaged. Where they should, how they should have been prosecuted. Yeah, no, absolutely. They should have been prosecuted. They were engaged in fraudulent activity. There's, there's ample uh, documentation. The, the Department of Justice says they, they weren't able to find evidence, but if you don't look, you don't find. All you have to do is check the, the loan tapes. We prosecuted uh, far more uh, executives from the savings and loan debacle in the, the 1990s, and that's when we had a Republican president. We, we have been operating under this strange assumption that somehow if you prosecute banks, even for criminal activity, I mean, HSBC was involved in documented cases of, of, of drug laundering, money laundering for terrorists, sort of the, the so-called bad guys that we, we throw in jail. They, there's been documented cases of that, and they, they all they received were uh, fines. They were significant fines in, in, in real terms, 1.9 billion, but in fact, nothing compared to the magnitude of the crimes that were committed. And the, the thinking is, well, if we start prosecuting these guys, if we start imposing the rule of law, that somehow um, we're going to create another financial crisis. My own feeling is that if you don't prosecute, if you subvert the rule of law, then you don't uh, have a proper functioning capitalist system. And more to the point uh, is you have a situation where um, uh, you it's what's called Gresham's Law, you know, where bad money drives out good, and so your system becomes fundamentally more corrupt. It becomes a kind of crony capitalism of the sort that we, for example, like to criticize the Russians for having. Well, that's exactly it. The good money is forced out the bad. Or yes. The bad money is forced out the good money. You yeah. do have this level of crony capitalism, and what happens is, in my opinion, is you get almost a, uh, a tribute system going on, so, yeah. sort of like the mafia, that movie The Goodfellows, when he said, you know, nobody understands that really the, the, the Don was there to, to protect them because there was no police department for them to go yeah. to and they paid the tribute. And what's happening now is uh, you look at it as a business proposition. You say, what's the fine? What's the cost? And the payouts are typically, you know, 10 percent of what your total profits are when yeah. nobody goes to jail. It's only when somebody goes to jail, the behavior changes. Yeah, that's you know, right. So the, the, the S and B, uh, the. The debacle with the savings and loans in the early nineties, people went to jail. Yeah. People, we went through bankruptcies and restructuring. We did, as you pointed out in the thirties, the same thing. This last time around, we did none of that. We just subsidized yes. the losses. So anyway, we a long story there, but uh, we won't re revisit that. But uh, Marshall, is the problem core problem? We just have too much debt in the world, both public and private. Uh, that is a big problem. I would say private debt is more of a problem than public debt. If you actually look at the great economic crises that we've had over the last hundred years or even longer, they've usually been preceded by large buildups in you know, private debt. You saw that in the 1920s, uh, leading to the Great Depression. Uh, you saw that uh, in, in the more recent crisis. I mean, we've had this massive expansion of, of private debt. This, of course, um, goes back to the problem that over the last um, uh, 30 or 40 years, you've had growing inequalities, you've had uh, the middle class under a lot of pressure. Uh, they have um, undertaken increasing forms of debt to try to sustain their, their lifestyles. And um, that, of course, has led to um, an, an underlying financial fragility. And, of course, it's, it's fine to take on the debt as long as the economy continues to grow, you can continue to service it. But when you have a, a demand shock of the kind that we had in 2008, all of a sudden people can't service their debts and um, their mortgages go bad and, and the financing structures that were used were fundamentally fragile. So we had this big expansion of public debt in response to that, in, in the sense that the so-called shadow banking system was effectively taken out of the shadows and put on the, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And um, likewise, a lot of these um, um, other debts were, were, were taken on board by the, the federal government. Um, we got no corresponding benefit for that, because as you pointed out, uh, there was no sanction attached to that. And uh, now these same people that were the biggest beneficiaries of, of these bailouts are now saying, we've got way too much private uh, public debt. We've got to cut that back. We've got to cut back Social Security, Medicare, um, even though the, the uh, uh, these were not the proximate causes of the crisis in, in 2008. So it's, uh, again, a, a pretty perverse example of the, the political capture we have with the wrong kind of people running our system. Yeah, they may not have been the cause then, but they could be the cause of the next crisis. The degree of unfunded pensions, underfunded pensions, that we have right now, the size of entitlement programs that are also completely unfunded, no matter what kind of accounting. Well, they're always funded in the sense, to the extent that you can always create the dollars to fund them. But, but, but I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's exactly. It's, but, it's, but what can want, they buy? Well, that's that's the question, and, and so you know, I, I guess I focus. You know, it's a it's a 
a question of numerator and, and, and denominator. You you want to grow GDP so that these things, you know, it, I mean, because at least if you grow GDP, you get more taxpayers into the system. They pay into these programs and and and, and they they can grow again. I mean, we had a similar talk about uh, the solvency uh, problem of like social security in 1983. Alan Greenspan came along, set up a commission. Uh, we increased the payroll tax, and that was supposed to solve the problem once and for all. Well, you know, here we are a bit later, and we've got the problem all over again. But again. This problem tends to become more evident uh, when you have uh, high rates of unemployment and when you have uh, the automatic stabilizers kicking into effect, which are, you know, pay out more in the way of, uh, of non-discretionary welfare programs. So the idea, as far as I'm concerned, is that you, you want to uh, create an environment where you can increase uh, employment jobs and so that you, um, and that's also fundamentally the best form of financial stability as well, because obviously when someone's got a, a job and he's paying down his debt and he's, his incomes are increasing, um, the bank gets his money, it gets their money back. Um, uh, the credit card companies get paid, and you get a lot less uh, of, of this kind of debt buildup. So it's cause and effect. I think you know you you can't just simply um, cut entitlements at a time of a, of a recession without having some corresponding growth initiative. And I think that's the problem we've had in Europe, for example. Um, they uh, continue to preach the politics of austerity, and it's actually made things worse in countries like Italy, Greece, Spain, etc. Well, I think it's thrown in the towel on, on any austerity talk. Anybody who has has been removed from power. So. Well, they, they have in Greece, but uh, you know whether they're able to escape the austerity yoke. I mean, when you're you're in a form of when you're in a form of debtor's jail, um, until the your your jailer, in this case it's the Germans, unlock the key and let you out, you're still in a bit of a you still have a bit of a problem. So so we'll see what happens to that. But that could be the the source of the next big uh, financial hiccup if we don't resolve Greece in in a in a proper way. I mean, I know a lot of people say that well, Greece is that tiny little bit of GDP, we can ring fence the problem. But of course, that's what we said about Lehman Brothers in 2008. So yeah, who knows? In, in, in terms of uh, new economic thinking and ideas that would better address debts and the degree of debt um, around the world, what, what, you, what is INET seeing? Who are what, what's coming to surface? Well, you know, one thing I will say uh, is that uh, the um, I think the the term the, the the title new economic thinking in one sense is a bit misleading because what we're I think we're really more an institute for sound economic thinking uh, um, and a lot of that uh, entails uh, bringing back some of the uh, the wisdom of some of the economists of the past before we became overly mathematized before we came and fell in love with with mathematical models that had no uh, relationship to reality so um, you know there's a lot of things we look at I, I, my particular focus is uh, uh, employment I, I I've said before I think. You solve a lot of problems by getting uh, a much fuller employment, and 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 um, you know one of the things that the, the ideas that I've looked at over the last few years is, is a job guarantee program. It's it's not unlike the the sorts of programs that were introduced during the the, the New Deal, uh, but I would make this a permanent feature of uh, of, of government. And, and and when people say, well, you're just going to be creating another level of government bureaucracy, I say, no, I'm I'm trying to uh, in effect. Replace much of the bureaucracy that's there for the unemployment insurance, the welfare, the food stamps, and replace that with um, programs which are designed to put people to work. Um, and at least then we could find out how much unemployment is, is involuntary, how much is, is, is voluntary. So the government, in effect, acts like a buffer stock. It, 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 it expands when the levels of private sector unemployment are high to absorb workers, get them placed in jobs. It may not be the same jobs they were in before, but it gets them working again. And the, this creates, if you like, a shovel-ready uh, buffer stock of, of, of employers that can transition back into the private sector, as in when the private sector wants to hire again. That's, I think, a fairly good idea. Um, well, I'm concerned that we have not fundamentally downsized the uh, financial uh, so the financialization of our economy. You know, the uh, in 2006, uh, the so-called fire sector, that's finance, insurance, and real estate, accounted for over 40 percent of all profits and GDP, which is a sign, really, of the tail uh, wagging the dog. You know, Wall Street has to be at the service of Main Street, and if anything, uh, the concentration of power at Wall Street, the four or five big Wall Street banks, the amount of uh, deposits that they um, hold on behalf of most Americans, which is now in excess of 50 percent, that's too high. Their political power is too high, and as a result, you get the same kind of perverse um, economic uh, um, and, and financial experiments being undertaken that got us into trouble in the first place. We haven't fundamentally changed that.
Well, maybe we need another financial crisis to do it, which is not a, a pleasant thought. Uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel in 2008 says you don't want to let a good crisis go to waste. Well, unfortunately, I think we did let a good crisis go to waste. I mean, look, I'm not in, in a position where I'm, I'm, I'm saying you need 25 percent unemployment to, to break the power of, of, of the banks. But, you know, as I as I like to say, um, you know, 25 percent unemployment, unemployment at least got us Glass-Steagall. 10 percent unemployment got us Dodd-Frank, which clearly is not enough. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. And it, no, I, I agree. And in fairness uh, to the central bankers whom I was criticizing earlier, um, I think part of the problem why they've undertaken these increasingly exotic experiments is uh, it's in part a, a reflection of the political dysfunction that we play, we, we're, we're facing right now. The political class is not stepping up and doing what needs to be done. So the central bankers feel they've got to do something. Uh, what they're doing is actually, I think, making the problem worse. So it's certainly not improving it by, by any stretch. And I think um, uh, really um, we've got a, a fundamentally corrupt system of government here, um, which, which um, I, I think is, is the real problem. It's, it's in, in many respects, it's a political economy problem rather than an economics problem we have right now. Leadership. Yeah. Free by reliance. Yeah. Is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's right. Only the to do that. And yeah. No, that's true. Uh, although I think uh, in many cases uh, the, the 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 pills we were prevented from taking those ugly pills because uh, the cronies who run the, the things at the top are still happily feeding the, themselves at the trough and, and and see no reason to change the system. So um, you know you need some sort of crisis which which fundamentally discredits them and galvanizes people. I mean you know the in the last elections you know we had over four billion dollars of money being spent in, in the midterm elections. That's historically unprecedented. But we had, you know, about a 40 percent turnout. And you really need something about double that. To, and you need people to be politically engaged. But if they, they see no hope, they, they, they don't get politically engaged. So it's a it's a real problem. Until they really feel it at the at the at the um, grocery store, at the gas pump with pitchforks and it can switch. Yes. Very out of time. Any key messages you'd like to leave with our listeners? Um, I guess the, the, the key message is uh, get, get involved and, uh, you know, there, there is a way of, of, of changing the system, but um, um, it's, it takes a lot of work at the, at the, at the grassroots. And um, I, I think if, if you don't start it, then these guys are going to slip in a whole bunch of uh, new types of laws, which is going to um, screw you in the end again. So um, I think it's important for people to stay engaged and involved and, and be vigilant, as Thomas Jefferson once said. Marshall, how can our listeners... More about your work, your writing, and the things you're involved with, and INET overall. Well, they can, uh, thanks for the, uh, the plug, they, they can uh, check our website, which is www.ineteconomics.org. That's one word, ineteconomics.org. Uh, uh, they'll not only see my work, they'll see some of the interviews I've done with various economic thinkers, and there's a lot of good scholarship that's, uh, that's uh, presented there. And, uh, yeah, I would urge your listeners to take a look. Marshall, thank you for sharing your time us today. I appreciate it. I know our listeners will, and we'll have to have you back later in the year. Gordon, it's been a great pleasure. Always nice to talk to a fellow you Canadian. Bet. Talk to you. Bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at gordontlong.com. 